All right. Good mo morning, afternoon. Uh, chapter 16, uh, 13, or uh, lecture B, uh, Transformation of the West. So we talked about the post-Civil War years, the Gilded Age, uh, and some changes there with big business. Now we're going to focus for this part of this lesson on the Transformation of the West. Um, so Transformation of the West 1, if you're following along with the slides. Uh, capitalism was prominent in the tra uh, Trans-Mississippi West. It was a place where people could go for a new economic opportunity. And you, you can even see in that, and if you've taken any other courses, uh, in the 1850s, really the West, like, California, uh, Kansas, even um, Oregon and others that if you moved west and you, you were poor in the east, you could make yourself a much better life uh, in the west. Uh, so the big thing about that is the west offered new opportunities. Now, it come at some costs, obviously, you had to move out there. It's remote. You had Indian threat for a long time. Um, so it's not an easy life, but if you were willing to endure it and, and adapt, it could be a great start and it definitely led the foundations for future uh, uh, success for families later on. Well, the West will be a very diverse region. You have the Great Plains, which is what we have kind of here. We're not on the true Great Plains until you get a little bit more Western into Kansas and Nebraska. When you go to Colorado from here or Wyoming, that's the true Great Plains. Pretty flat and boring, some hills. Uh, Kansas has the Flint Hills, which is a little bit more rolling than pe most people would think, but relatively treeless. Then you move into the Rocky Mountains, uh, which go up and down, obviously, at the Continental Divide. Vast, different landscape, uh, mountainous, uh, dry. Then you have the desert of the Southwest getting down into New Mexico, Arizona, where it's dry, not a lot of rain, um, wide open spaces. Uh, if you ever watched uh, Roadrunner um, cartoons growing up, which I did, and it might be a little bit old for you, they have the plateaus of the Southwest, uh, just very, very dry, uh, very nomadic area for people down there. And then you go all the way to California, you got the beaches, obviously everyone thinks about, but then you got the Sierra Nevada mountain range. You get another mountain range, which, which has like Yosemite um, and runs up all the way up into the Pacific Northwest and you have the rainy climate and stuff. So you have a very drastically different landscape in the West where the East, the Appalachia area is pretty much uh, wooded, uh, relatively the same. The West is a, a land of many different areas. The West required the active intervention of the federal government. Land get, grants will be given to the farmers, railroad, and mining companies to get them to move out there, basically giving them free land or cheap land. And they will, But the thing is, you have to stay on the land. You can't leave it, so they're going to be obligated to it. The Moral Land Grant Act, states created new universities. Land will be given to the new states that will move in the West to create new institution, institutions of education. New, newly created Western territories such as Arizona, Idaho, Montana, and Dakotas remained under federal control for longer than had been the pattern in the East because they were hard to get people to move there. Arizona's population really doesn't uh, increase until the invention of the air conditioning for obvious reasons. Uh, and then obviously better irrigation practices. In Idaho, uh, pretty mountainous, uh, pretty beautiful state. And then obviously Montana has large stretches of nothingness and the mountain ranges and such. Now, moving on to, and there's a picture. If you're following along on the slides, you can kind of see it here on the video of the, uh, of the plains. You have the buffalo on the plains leading up to the Rocky Mountains. Honestly, if I could travel through time, this is a period I would have loved to see with the buffalo roaming the open plains, um, heading into the mountains. Now, farming. So a trans transformation of the West, too. Farming in the Trans-Mississippi West. Farmers flooded the West after the Civil War using the Homestead Act, which was passed in 1862. Uh, I think it was for $10, they got 50 acres of land or something along those lines. Either case, they got a really good deal. However, they had to stay on the land for so long, and with that, uh, meant a lot of hardships. A new agricultural empire producing wheat and corn rose in the middle border states, which you have Minnesota, Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas. Uh, farmers were a diverse group, including native-born Easterners, blacks escaping the South, and immigrants from Canada, Germany, Scandinavia, and Great Britain. If you look at our area specifically, where we at was predominantly German. There was some Scandinavian, um, but our area is historically uh, German. In the late 19th century, North Dakota was the most multicultural state, but that will change. Uh, up until really the 20th century, though, they had a large group from Asians to Germans and so forth in North Dakota. So a lot of people don't realize. Life was not as easy on the Great Plains. Women had it hard. Obviously, they had to take care of the family. And then clothing, they didn't necessarily could go down um, even buy uh, from stores. They had to make do. They had to grow gardens. They had to, they had to live um, basically on their own. Bonanza Farms. 
Uh, and this is where the TV show from the 50s that some people might have heard of uh, came up, but covered thousands of acres and employs large number of agricultural workers. It's very close to like a ranch almost. Uh, family farms though will still dominate. These bonanza farms, these big farms will not be the norm. Most will still be smaller. Railroads brought factory products to the West and the farmers, and this is gonna have the creation of the catalog come along later. So farmers, uh, people out in the West could order stuff via catalog and have it sent to them. Economic depressions, expansion of farming around the world also drove prices down, which will hurt the farmers uh, during this period as well. Now transformation of the West, the cowboy and the corporate West. Uh, just a side note, historically, originally cowboy was actually a derogatory term, uh, usually referring to a black um, farmhand. Uh, at this early in incarnation, but today cowboy is accepted as an okay word to describe basically, um, you know, Western ranchers and stuff. But understand that the, the origin of that word was a derogatory term to some degree. Now, 1880s was the was the cattle age. Um, cattle drives declined as more and more land was fenced off, obviously. Uh, but cattle will be driven large distances to the railroad heads, um, and cattle are quite profitable. Most of those cattle will end up in places like Chicago or Cincinnati where they will be butchered, primarily Chicago, though. By 1890, a high percentage of population lived, um, I lost my spot, lived in cities. Uh, large corporate enterprises appeared throughout the West and often controlled back, were often controlled back East. Um, so as people move to the West, most are going to congregate in cities, which makes sense. But you'll have population centers start to grow up and center around new cities. Um, Kansas City, just south of this, is a good example of this. It really did not exist. Uh, we go back over 150 years ago, but now Kansas City is one of the biggest cities in the Midwest. Uh, um, and rival St. Louis, a much, much older city. Uh, now, the Chinese presence. Uh, came to work in the mines, factories, and railroad construction. Many were unattached men, but several families, several other families will come later on. By 1880, 105,000 lived in the United States. Three-fourths, though, will live primarily in Canada or California, where they made up half of the state's farm workers. Now, understand, the Chinese presence is small, but it's significant. This will decrease at the turn of the century as there's a return of nativism, uh, wanting to exclude Asians from immigration, um, those period of cycles we have of immigration. So the Chinese presence will actually shrink uh, post this, this era. Now, moving on to, and there's a picture of cowboys as we often uh, come to describe them. They wore the long, I can't think of the things on their legs. Um, are they, they're not chaps, are they? Yeah, chaps, chaps. Um, they'd wear, uh, they would be horseback. They were pretty rough men, gruff. Uh, but yeah, cowboys, uh, obviously, and we had them around here, Bilby Ranch Lake, which was just east of here. Uh, had a ranch um, that employed several cowboys in the late 1800s. So this phenomenon obviously did have a huge uh, impact in our area as well. Transformation of the West 4. This leads to an interesting and very unique period um, in the West as well as conflict on the Mormon frontier. Uh, and just as a side note, I actually read uh, a Sherlock Holmes story. Uh, one of his, the, uh, the first stories detailing Holmes uh, talking about Holmes, he solves a case that ends up in London. And it's all—it's a book written about an experience of a family with Brigham Young, the, the leader of the Mormons in Utah. And I'm not going to here to get into the Mormon, anything of like that, but it was interesting. The book painted the Mormons as a detestable group that was um, uh, just really ruthless to its people. Women had no rights. And it was just really painted Mormons as some people not to like, which was very interesting uh, coming from a late 1800s book, uh, especially a British novel of all things. Uh, and so Mormon frontier, people moving west are going to run into the Mormons who kind of fled west because no one wanted them in the east. And they're going to settle in Utah and Utah will later become a state. But it's an area that people kind of avoid for a while. So they had to move west to the Utah Territory to, to avoid persecution. Uh, President James Buchanan removed Brigham Bring Young as governor. Now, Young refused to comply, and federal troops were sent to the area until the beginning of the Civil War, which they will be pulled. In 1857, a group of Mormons attacked a wagon of 100 travelers and killed, uh, killed them. 20 years later, one member was convicted of murder. So you can see the Mormons kind of removed themselves from civilization, went outside of it, and created their own little place. Um, and they will slowly go through some reforms, and then they'll eventually be admitted as a state and back into the United States. But Utah was not an area you necessarily wanted to go to at that point. In the 1880s, they will finally outlaw polygamy. Um, but like I said, that Sherlock Holmes novel really 
really opened my eyes to kind of like, though it's a novel and it's a work of fiction, it was interesting to see an international perspective on the whole Mormonology of that area. Um, so anyway, now subjection of the Plains Indians, uh, another sad incident. Uh, Transcontinental Railroad brought a final change to the Indian world and pretty much led to their ultimate final demise. Conflict arose more and more as settlers moved onto Indian lands, took it, and the railroads obviously came across as well. Grant's peace policy in the end went to destroy Indian way of life, hunted the buffalo, um, and we always heard the rise of uh, Buffalo Bill and all that. So it's essentially the uh, government will go after the food supply and everything that will make the Indians move uh, or have their society exist, which was the buffalo. Now, moving on, the transformation of the West Five. Let me be a free man. Armory's relentless tax broke the power of one tribe after another. O.O. Oh, oh, Howard punished the Nez Perce Indians on a, uh, pursued them on a 1700 mile chase uh, trying to get uh, to Canada. They were forced to Oklahoma and Chief Joseph gave a powerful speech in Washington. Uh, now, one thing about the Nez Perce, the Indi they're the Indian tribe that helped Lewis and Clark up in the Pacific Northwest. So these Indians are used to colder climate, uh, more forestry, and they'll be moved to Oklahoma, which is the opposite of that type of uh, environment. This is also going to lead to, after the, the Civil War, the Battle of Little Bighorn, which uh, Custer, one of the worst incompetent military officers in U.S. history, uh, will go on um, attacking Indian tribes and will be isolated uh, by, I believe, is it Crazy Horse? I think it is. Uh, yeah, and Custer's, pretty much him and his whole force is murdered, wiped out. I'm not going to use the word murdered. They're going to be wiped out because I, I will take the Indian side on this. And... Custer was not a good person, and he will ultimately be uh, defeated. And this will lead to also another significant thing in which he is scalped. Uh, now, Little Bighorn is one of the very few major victories for the Indians in this period, uh, but it comes at a high cost as well. We make an Indian life, abolish treaties, and work to assimilate the Indians. Treaties will have no bearing anymore. And obviously, this will lead to the great assimilation of Indians into the American system. Now... Moving on to the uh, Western uh, Treasury in the West Six, the Dawes Act and Wounded Knee. Uh, Act broke up the land of nearly all the tribes and small parcels be distributed to Indian families with the remainder auctioned off to white purchasers. Basically what the Dawes Act did was gave Indians some small amount of land, um, not quite the reservation system we think of it today, uh, but then most of the other rest of the, the good land was sold to white uh, purchasers. 1.5 million of acres of land uh, from the Native Americans was taken. Some Indians uh, sought solace in the ghost dance, which will actually be outlawed for a period, uh, but they still practiced it. And then at Wounded Knee, they were conducting a, an illegal ghost dance on December 20 of 1890, uh, basically freaked the army individuals, uh, military that was there. They will open fire, killing 150 to 200 Indian, Indians, mostly women and children that were at the ghost dance. So Wounded Knee is a horrific moment um, in this final escalation or final event with Indians in the U.S. military and U.S. government. Um, as a member of the military, this is one moment. I, uh, this is, we're not proud of this. This is not a good thing. Uh, and this leads to the end of major uh, engagements with the Indians and the, the government and the military. Uh, but this was just simply um, just a horrific event. Now, BIP reality in the Wild West. A new image, a lawless place ruled by, by cowboys and Indians. This is 1950s television. Um, it's not really accurate necessarily. An image of violent yet romantic frontier would later become a staple of Hollywood. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show popularized some of these ideas. But the, really, the struggle of normal people played no role um, in these images. So when you watch like uh, Bonanza, Gunsmoke, which is very famous. We watched, actually watched it if you took my history of film class. We watched episodes of that. Of that romanticized, the damsel in distress. Uh, you know, the, these, these nice little mining towns and all that, that was not the norm. Most of the, the West was more like the Reverend. If you've seen Leonardo DiCaprio's Oscar-winning performance, attacked by a bear, you know, ruthless, you know, you're attacked. It, it's a lot more violent um, and wild, per se, than the, some of the Hollywood perception. And they obviously, they also, also portray Indians as very stupid at times, uh, which was not uh, necessarily accurate. And then multicultural, multi-ethnic population also disappeared. Uh, the one thing that Hollywood doesn't capture is between the 1870s and the 1890s, the West was very pluralistic in, its, in the group of people that were there. But as we close on the transformation of the West, you literally have a dramatic shift um, just in a lot of how the West is. You go a century or earlier with Lewis and Clark, 
what you get by 1890 is not what was there in 1800 or 1804 when Lewis Clark first trans uh, trans travel or traveled the west from St. Louis. Uh, and so, yeah, that will conclude this lecture, this uh, lecture, chapter 16, lecture B. The next lecture, we'll get into the politics of the Gilded Age. So the West is really kind of out there and it will change. Uh, really by 1900, you're going to start to see uh, the whole country as a, ha a whole, as we think of it in its modern uh, shape, is going to start to really start to take form.